When I first started questioning some of the main tenets of my faith back in 2011, I spent about six months obsessively reading near-death experiences online. And now, Christianity hands us a model of reality that says, even though God is infinite and eternal, He only gives us one short little lifetime to figure everything out, and that one little snap of the fingers determines our fate for the rest of eternity. No second chances, no learning, no growing, just a momentary flash in the pan, followed by an eternity in one of two locations. And to my surprise, after reading literally thousands of near-death experiences, not a single solitary one of them supported the one-shot-only model that Christianity teaches us. I would say that at least 90% of the NDEs that I read over that six-month period made some kind of mention of reincarnation, remembering past lives, or why we chose to come to this particular life. And that the whole point of why we come here is so that we can learn and evolve towards the source. And so it's pretty apparent now with more and more churches shutting down by the day that people no longer resonate with this one-shot only model that Christianity has given to us. We as a collective have evolved out of this archaic belief system and people are looking for a model of reality that makes more rational sense to this strange and mysterious world we find ourselves in. If Christianity has any hope of remaining relevant in this new era, then there needs to be people who are willing to wrestle with the tough questions and think outside of the box. And I personally would like to be one of those people that helps to push Christianity forward, which is why I'm making these videos in the first place. So in this recent string of episodes where we're talking about taboo topics in the Christian world, we're taking on the mother load of them all today as we talk about the topic of reincarnation. And after his mind-blowing lecture on astrology in the Bible a few weeks ago, I of course had to have Aaron Tomlinson back on to join me for this conversation. So in today's episode, get ready to expand your mind and go where no good fundamentalist dares to tread as we talk about the case for reincarnation. Welcome back to Moving Backwards, episode 21. <laughs> My name is Aaron, and uh, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Thanks for being here. Today, we are continuing our discussion on taboo topics in the Christian world, all the subjects you weren't allowed to talk about, think about, read about, learn about. And uh, I'm joined again today by my very good friend and metaphysical enthusiast, the uh, same exact person who blew your mind on the astrology episode a few weeks ago, Pastor Aaron Tomlinson. Thanks for being here, man. Hey, Aaron. Thanks for having me on again. I love it, man. I'm having a great time with it. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Dude, we got such a great response from the astrology video. Like people just, their minds were blown by what you shared and all the things you linked <laughs> together. So I was like, well, we got to have an encore performance, you know? Yeah. So let's pick a subject even more taboo. <laughs> <laughs> you think it is in the Christian world? Oh, absolutely. I, I think so. You're probably right. <laughs> it's, it's one of those, because like the reincarnation thing, it confronts or... Um, uh, threatens the Christian model so much where astrology Absolutely. doesn't really threaten anything particularly. Right. Yeah, so, exactly. So I guess we'll find out based on the comments. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will. Based, based on how many more friends I lose. <laughs> <laughs> or gain, get a new audience. Or gain, or gain. Yes. Thank you. I need to be more uh, positive. <laughs> well, since our last uh, video, you started your YouTube channel and I think you've uploaded yeah. You have a bunch of sermons on there already, but right. you've uploaded three or four videos. Um, one that I, I, I haven't watched all of them, but the one that I did watch was incredible called uh, Jesus in the Shadow Self. I'll put a card right here for that, right here for that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you guys need to go check his stuff out. If you're not subscribed already, if you like what he shared in the last video, I promise you're going to want to be a subscriber on his channel. He's got lots of great content coming out. So for today, we're talking about reincarnation. How reincarnation, how a, you know, quote unquote Christian, whatever that means anymore, um, could believe in reincarnation and how it actually might have some biblical legitimacy. And so what we're going to do first is just talk about basically what reincarnation is and clear up some of the misconceptions around that. 
And then uh, Pastor Aaron's going to get into some of the biblical themes uh, that you might not be aware of in reincarnation. So the standard Christian model, right, Aaron, for the world, for the universe, is that God is infinite. God's eternal. He's been around for trillions of years to infinity. We are also eternal souls. We will exist for infinity. But we only get one short life. One shot. You get one shot, maybe 80 years if you're lucky, and then the rest of infinity is decided upon if you figure out the human experience in one short lifetime. Yeah, well, and basically, if you get the information right, right? I mean, you, yeah. you got one shot. It's kind of like a great big test. You got one shot to figure out what's the path to salvation. And then depending on your brand of Christianity, if you're Catholic, it's got to come through the church. If you're evangelical, it's got to come through believing in prayer. If you're Protestant, faith, <laughs> whatever the case may be. Nobody can decide what it, the criteria actually is. Right. But what they do but you, agree on... But if you miss it, but if you miss it, right. you're screwed for all eternity. <laughs> so basically, you're plopped into this universe, and it's like somebody hands you a golf club and is like, all right, you got to make a hole in one. Exactly. Get one shot. <laughs> yeah. Didn't, didn't give you any lessons, but hey. <laughs> no, no reference frame, no nothing. You, God is invisible, inaudible. There's no signs of his existence, but you know, yep. you got to figure it out. Yeah. So, I personally don't ascribe to that model. <laughs> uh, and so this is where we can start having real discussions about what the nature of existence really is, what the nature right. of a soul really is. And that's where I think it gets really interesting for me is, um, you know, I've always been fascinated by the basic questions that I think most of us probably are of like, what are we doing here? How did we get here? Who am I? Where did I come from? Right. Um, where am I going after this? And so I went through a period where I studied near-death experiences very heavily. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a website called nderf.org. You've probably mm -hmm. been there before. And it's just a, basically a database by a couple of scientists who started collecting back in like 1998. Just every verified near-death experience they could get their hands on and sort of um, collecting the data and seeing where the similarities are, what themes continue to show up in these near-death experiences. And the remarkable thing about NDEs is that, you know, like 90% of them have this, all of the same themes in them, you know, the out of body experience, going towards the light, um, having a life review, um, feeling an overwhelming sense of peace and love and assurance and all that. And another one of the very prevalent themes is reincarnation. Um, people learning that they've had many lifetimes before and that they get to sort of choose their lifetimes, the lessons that they learn, things of that nature. And, you know, just from a logical standpoint, that makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think the big issue, if you want to look at it from a Christian perspective, the, the general Western view, at least, and, and across the board anymore throughout the world in Christianity, is what happens to the person who doesn't go to heaven when they die? Yes. And so the traditional answer is, well, they go to hell. <laughs> so, and, and it... it it mind boggles me that we somehow perceive that as God's justice because he's going to punish temporal sins for all eternity. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then he stakes the whole thing on whether or not you believe in an event that the Bible itself says only 500 people witnessed. Yep. And I remember sitting in a, in a parking lot thinking that just doesn't make sense. <laughs> and I remember thinking, you know, reincarnation, at least the Hindus, they believe in reincarnation. At least you get, repeated opportunities, or based on however a person views karma, some views of karma view it as sort of like a, a justice system. Uh -huh. So you pay for your sins in the next life. That, to me, seems more compassionate than burning for all eternity. I, I, we probably didn't want to get into this issue, but I was covering it with uh, the church, and I was like, um, you know, have you ever thought about these, some of these serial killers or, you know, really kind of that we perceive as very evil people who want to torture someone. If you ever saw the movie Law Abiding Citizen, uh -huh. uh, when, when he goes, there's this, it's a revenge movie. Uh -huh. And at one point in the movie, the guy uh, finds uh, medical. Uh, Gerard Butler? Yeah. Yes, I've seen that movie. Yeah, he finds drugs to keep the guy awake while he tortures him. Yes. And I thought, well, that's what God does for all eternity. Yeah. God makes Hitler look like Mother Teresa. 
Absolutely. So, but when you look at it biblically and you find out hell doesn't exist, which you've done some excellent videos on that, by the way, that people can find on your channel, then you have to start to ask yourself, well, then what really does happen after death? What really does happen? Because I can tell you that like, if I was in, if I was the guy in charge and I had to come up with a model for how to, you know, deal with wrongdoing, I would make it so that you just keep coming back until you get the right answers. Mm -hmm. And that sure. all of the mistakes that you make, you have to suffer the consequences for them. Sure. You know, I would build, I would build justice into reality itself. I wouldn't like save justice for after the whole event's over and right. give people no reference frame for what justice is until later. Like right. let them learn as they go. Like let them make mistakes, give them the free will that we so acknowledge that God is in favor of. And then they'll learn from their mistakes as they go, right? Right, exactly. Makes a lot more sense that way. So with reincarnation, there's the whole theme of karma, like you just talked about, that comes in mm -hmm. to play a lot. And I think um, for me, a couple of the big misconceptions are the idea, like you mentioned, that what karma means is that you have to pay the sins of your past lives in your next life, like this sort of mm -hmm. carryover. And that's where the idea of like law of attraction comes into play, which says that you always pay for your consequences now in this life. Like you yeah. are experiencing already the consequence of your actions. Like people will say in Christianity, well, if there's no eternal torment, then what's the punishment for sin? Right. Right. And the answer is the sin is the punishment. Right. Feeling horrible about yourself, living with guilt, shame, self-hatred, a fragmented consciousness, uh, feeling alone and isolated, that is the, con not to mention like just actual physical consequences like going to jail or getting hurt by someone or murdered or any of the things that can happen to you if you, you know, do unwise things. There's, there are consequences built into reality everywhere we look. Right. So the idea of reincarnation makes a lot of sense that, you know, from a basic standpoint, we can say, you know, what is the universe? What's the point of being here? There's no real way to answer that question, obviously, but I think the best way we could answer it is to say the idea of the fact that God is experiencing himself in the universe, through the universe, right? right. The, the medium through which God knows himself. Right, and I think then the, the universe becomes, or the multiverse, as some people would choose to call it, becomes a learning environment, because really, I mean, what is the point of punishment for punishment's sake? Right. Why would you create that? I mean, how, in what sense is that just or redemptive? Yep. And so if you create an environment where there can be learning and growth and development, then perhaps that's why we're here. And perhaps we don't just get one shot at it because then what happens, like, this is another thing that bothered me. Like what happens to babies? Like you would be hard pressed to find a really hard hearted fundamentalist yeah. that would tell you a baby that hasn't done anything is going to go to hell just because they got a disease or something, or their parents didn't know to get them baptized by the Catholic church right? or whatever the case may be. I mean, you got to find a really uh, hard hearted person that's going to say that. So you got a, a baby who comes and doesn't do anything, doesn't pass the test, anything. And they they got it made, man. They, they go to heaven right away. Um, whereas some of the rest of us have to deal with temptation and life and, what information are we exposed to? What information are we not exposed to? And then all of a sudden now, because we didn't get the information right, we're going to, you know, be punished for the sake of punishment. So I think, you know, we need to rethink the idea of justice as well, what that means. 100%. You made a really good point right there. If, if that model of reality is true, then aborted babies got the lottery ticket. Exactly. So why are we trying to stop it? <laughs> exactly. It's a complete contradiction. It completely. Save them from this hellish, agonizing reality we all find ourselves in. Yeah, and ultimately save them from eternal hellfire, right? Right, yeah, even worse. <laughs> or if you come from a tradition that believes you can backslide and lose your salvation, then why don't we just hold you underwater longer in the baptismal font? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be the more this compassionate is for your thing own to good. do? <laughs> just drown them right there, man. Wouldn't that be the most compassionate thing to do? It's so funny you say that because it's absolutely true. Like if that model of reality is the real model, then the most loving thing you can do for anyone is to murder them. <laughs> exactly. Get them saved and send them on. They don't have anything else to do here. 
No. no we're just you know, here to make exist. Yeah. We're just here to figure out the right prayer to pray until we go to heaven forever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's and, or we say, sanity. or we say, God's, you know, punishing me because he's trying to teach me something. Well, to what end? Right. Because apparently when you leave this life, you know, your soul's perfected. Apparently. Which also doesn't make any sense at all. That doesn't make any sense. Like, okay, if you, if God, you know, they say, well, the reason he makes us have this one short lifetime is because God wants free will and he can't <laughs> infringe on anyone's free will. Okay, so he wants free will. So he, so we're now, obviously, I can choose of my own free will to not sin. I can be right. perfect, right? right? Well, no, no one, all have sinned, brother. Okay, wait, so God made me to be imperfect. I'm not capable of being perfect. And he's holding me to the standard of perfection anyways. And then if I don't meet that standard, which I won't, he will barbecue me forever for being who he created me to be. Right. And he'll keep reviving you so he can keep torturing you <laughs> to get his kicks for all eternity. <laughs> it's so insane. It is insane, Aaron. So enter reincarnation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I really like the idea of reincarnation because it makes a lot of sense out of all of these questions that we're asking, right? Right. Um, if God is experiencing himself, it is an evolutionary journey. So you could think of it as like, you know, from God's perspective, uh, you know, from the absolute perspective, God can't know or experience what God is like from the realm of perfection because there's no contrast, right? That's what mm -hmm. perfection means. There is no contrast. Mm -hmm. So in order to experience God's self, he has to create some sort of medium through which to do so that gives him that contrast, right? Right. So he creates the manifest universe and sort of splits himself into infinite amount of pieces, which each one of you and I listening are one fragment of God's infinite being, knowing itself. And then each one of those souls, we could call them, go on an evolutionary journey where they incarnate into different realities and learn the lessons of love and wisdom and unity and all these things that are the theme of the essence of the creator, yeah? Right. So uh, if there's a book, if you're really interested in learning more about reincarnation, this book is a good place to start. Uh, many Lives, Many Masters. Uh, Pastor Aaron's read it. I just finished reading it. Uh, it's about a uh, what is this? psychiatrist, yep. uh, Brian L. Weiss, who had a patient named Catherine who had a very, she was very gifted um, psychically. She could he put her under hypnosis and she would remember all of her past lives. And so this book kind of um, through, the, through the masters that she meets after each lifetime who sort of help her choose her next incarnation and all that stuff. She learns a lot about what reincarnation is and why we incarnate, what lessons we learn. This is a good place to start. And then if you want like a PhD level understanding of reincarnation, then you'll want to read The Law of One. <clears throat> the Law of One is a five book series, a channeled series from the uh, late 80s, early 80s, um, where the entity named Ra uh, describes in unbelievable detail, um, even scientifically, metaphysically speaking, what reincarnation is, the process of it, um, and it's, it's absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, nothing will change your life and give you a greater sense of peace about your existence, in my opinion, than understanding these things. And what Ra talks about is the concept of the seven densities of consciousness. And this is where things get really interesting. So what Ra says is that consciousness, or which is sort of the, uh, you know, the mode of how God knows itself in form, uh, consciousness is some sort of arranged in seven layers. And these seven layers correspond to the seven colors of the color wheel, the seven notes on a musical scale, uh, the seven energy centers. We see this theme of seven, which is why seven's like God's number, uh, throughout all of creation. Uh, in this book, they also say there's seven dimensions in the astral plane that you can you go to once you uh, finish an incarnation. So the first density of consciousness is like um, just pure organic matter, the four elements, rock, or earth, water, air, and fire. And so these four elements for billions and billions of years, you know, collide into one another. The wind blows on the earth, the water, the volcanoes, the fire, the magma. And eventually, after billions of years of this, contrast, uh, consciousness evolves into the second density, which is um, 
like plant life, mineral life, and animal life. So second density is where consciousness becomes uh, aware because you know in the rock, in the fire, it's not and there's no awareness. There's just pure consciousness, pure being itself. Second density becomes aware, and then as second density goes forth um, through their own contrast of you know prey and predator, um, survival, all that stuff. That's the friction that eventually evolves consciousness to the third density, which is where uh, the human species is right now, where consciousness becomes self-aware, understanding that I exist. And so this is sort of the process of of how God wakes up to itself within physical form so that it can go through this evolutionary journey. Um, I'm sure you've heard this phrase, Aaron, and let me know if you haven't, but Sure. There's a really cool phrase that, or a saying that says, um, consciousness sleeps in the rock, mm. it dreams in the animal, and it wakes up in the human. Interesting. That's, that's a great concept. You know, one of the things, like, we're kind of asking the question, can a Christian believe in uh, reincarnation? And we'll get a little bit into that more later, but one of the problems that... Uh, the Christian church has had is the whole concept of creation, because what you're talking about is God emanating out of God's self <clears throat> creation so that God is both uh, within it, but also transcendent. So yeah. some people will accuse you of being a pantheist that, you know, everything is God. Oh, you know, Aaron, Aaron, the two Aaron's are out there now <laughs> worshiping rocks or whatever and talking about <laughs> rocks having consciousness. And, and, and I get it. Um, but, but the concept is that, that God is both inhabiting, but also is transcendent from his creation. So he's also, or the divine, he, she, is also other than creation, mm-hmm. uh, which is a biblical concept because okay. the Bible talks about God being all and in all. Um, however, that as church doctrine developed, they developed the idea that God created or made creation ex nihilo, mm-hmm. which means Latin for out of nothing, which I think is a mistranslation because God in God's self is no thing. You, you, you can't find a thing that is God. Right. So I don't think it was God, like a separate entity making out of space or whatever, what is nothing. Uh, but so there, I think the Bible teaches or can teach emanation, mm-hmm. but that's typically viewed as an Eastern view and was condemned as heretical by the church very early on. So you have God as being completely other than, yeah, his creation. And so that's the first problem w- with some of the things that you're sharing that would yeah. cause conflict within at least what has been the Orthodox Christian teaching. You're totally right, which is also a contradiction because, you know, if, if creation isn't God, then what resources did God use other than his own being to create the universe, <laughs> right? Right. Like, how can God be separate? Like, there has to be one source. And right. if you're saying that God is separate from his creation, then where is the second God which made that creation? And where's the space for the separation? Yeah, where would the space dwell in and of itself? Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, So you made a point in the last video on astrology about the age of Aquarius and the Mm -hmm. diurnal cycle that we clicked into in 2012. Mm -hmm. So according to Ron, this was written in the 80s or channeled in the 80s. He said, you know, in 30 years time, the planet will go through its next diurnal cycle in 2012. And that's the whole Mayan calendar scare and all that. Okay. Nobody really had a good understanding of what that 2012 thing was. Um, But what Ron explains is that our planet shifted into or would shift into from his perspective in the 80s, the, the fourth density or becoming a fourth density planet, which means that the actual electromagnetic energy or frequency of the planet would shift to the vibration that allows fourth density lessons to become available. Wow. So in the same way that Earth had to shift from second density to third density at some point to allow consciousness to become uh, self-aware, right? It's now done that for the fourth density. So we've literally just entered into a new age, age of Aquarius, And I think the cool thing is how we can see the evidence of this just dramatically so in our world right now. Absolutely. Like since 2012, we've had an incredible amount of social justice reform. Just the overall environment of the world, you know, through the internet and social media is becoming so much more cohesive Mm -hmm. and, and united and saying, hey, we should all love one another. We should be good to one another. 
And the only reason people deny that that's very obviously the case is because they say, well, we've got people like Trump and stuff, though. And that's the nature of polarity, which is that any advancement there, there is, the other side resists with equal force. So sure. it's actually a sign that there is progress happening, right? That's good, right. <clears throat> so uh, fourth density is the density of love and understanding. And then fifth density, sixth density, seventh density uh, are the next three. And after the seventh density, which is the gateway density, uh, you click into the eighth, which is the new octave of the next universe or creation yeah. um, from which we have no reference frame to even know what that would be like. Right. So that's sort of how Ra lays out the uh, process of reincarnation in that, you know, you've been reincarnating in these third density bodies for, you know, I don't know, 80, 83 lifetimes in this book, she says. Mm -hmm. um, and once you evolve enough, you become enlightened and you realize that you are one with God, you are one with everything, then you basically vibrationally have access to start incarnating into fourth density uh, incarnations, be it on this planet or another planet. And I think even though our planet is at the very, literally the very beginning of fourth density, it's going to take, you know, thousands and thousands of years before, <clears throat> like, sure fourth density incarnations become really available. So right now, the souls that are incarnating on Earth are basically ones that are looking to learn the end stage lessons of, of um, third density, which is like basically enlightenment stuff, mm -hmm. um, and or beginning lessons of fourth density, which is love and understanding, compassion, and things like that. <clears throat> so with the idea of karma, what karma is from, from that perspective is that, let's say that like, I commit murder in this lifetime. I murder somebody. Sure. I have to, everything must come through evolution. Um, nothing, God does not just like kapoof anything into existence, right? Right, yeah. Everything starts small. Even embryos in the womb, seeds that get planted, um, everything starts small and grows and develops. It's, it's apparent in all of creation. Yep. I mean, everything started from a single cell on earth, so. Right. <clears throat> so you have to evolve out of these distortions and um, points of view that are in contradiction to the essence of the creator, which of course murder is in opposition to love. God is love. So when you go back to the astral plane after your lifetime is over, you have the, you know, the famous life review. Mm -hmm. You get to see everything you did. And what, what people say in NDEs, which is really interesting, is that you don't just see your life but you actually experience your life through the perspective of the people that you harmed. Wow. Um, if you've ever taken psychedelics, you kind of have that same experience with psychedelics where you see some of the stuff you've done and you get to understand it from the perspective of like your parents or your, the person you, you know, committed that sin against. And mm -hmm. it absolutely rivets you to your core. Like it makes you super motivated to become like the best version of yourself. That's why psychedelics are being so highly used in psychotherapy right now. Right. And yeah, become right. legalized, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, if you look at, I mean, when we're talking about reincarnation, you're talking about an idea that's as old as humanity. So one of the things that's interesting, the oldest, I guess, forms of religion would be probably best labeled under the term of shamanism. Uh -huh. And, you know, they would use psychedelics for really breaking out of the ego. Uh, which is exactly what you're talking about. When when I'm doing something to someone else, the, my understanding of it is being filtered based on how I'm self-reflecting. Yeah. And that self-reflection, which you've taught on as well and done a brilliant job, uh, then is the ego. So it blinds me from seeing the, the actual damage that I'm doing to the other person. So yes. what can happen with micro doses, and I want to emphasize micro doses mm -hmm. <laughs> of yeah. psychedelics is, is that it can, sh it can help a person shed that ego yeah. in a way that, that is accelerated. You can do the same thing with meditation and spiritual practice, but it usually happens over a longer period of time. This mm -hmm. accelerates that process. And so it allows people to have those kind of insights about themselves and about reality and about their actions outside of the formation of their egos. Yes, that's a great example. It's, it's sort of like, uh, well, the, the ego is the belief in separation, right? Right. 
Um, so when you believe you're separate from your brother, then you feel justified in harming your brother for some reason. Right. And psychedelics basically just dissolve boundaries. Right. So you get to see that, oh, my brother is me. I am them. And I just harmed myself essentially in another form. Right. And you experience the consequences of that, like we talked about a minute ago. Right. So with karma, like I was saying, let's say I murder somebody. I go back to the astral. I see my life review. Oh, my gosh. How can I have done something so heinous? So I am immediately motivated to choose a lifetime where I can unlearn that lesson, right? Mm -hmm. um, where I can cleanse that distortion from my frequency. Right. Your soul is basically just a frequency. And you integrate different vibrations into that frequency as you go through these lifetimes and through the catalyst of experience, suffering, all that different stuff. Your soul accumulates different vibrations and integrates them. So a person who's a murderer has integrated a vibration of hatred, right? Anger. So in order to cleanse that distortion from my frequency, I might actually choose to reincarnate as somebody who gets murdered. So I'm not paying the sins of my past because that's not how the universe works. It's not how justice works. But what I am doing is trying to right the wrongs that I did because I am the one bearing the consequence of that. And I want to be free of that because when you're in that heavenly realm, you can see everything with, from the highest perspective. So it's easy to know what's right and wrong. But down here, we go through that veiling process where we forget who we actually are. We forget all our previous lifetimes and we forget that we're eternal because we're trying to have this organic experience where we can evolve, right? Right, right. If there isn't contrast, then the then consciousness would not evolve. It'd, it'd be doing great. It would just chill. Mm -hmm. sure. So in order to have that experience of God knowing itself, it has to learn the lessons of love. How do you learn the lessons of love? You experience opposite, the opposition of love, the ignorance of love. So that's kind of how karma works from a cosmic perspective. And so a lot of the um, uh, rebuttals you get from Christians against reincarnation are, you know, the, oh, karma is ridiculous. You think that we have to pay for our sins the next lifetime? No, we just pay for all of eternity and get tortured and stuff, which is hilarious because it's like a way worse idea than karma. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I think they would come back and say, uh, but, we, you know, we can have forgiveness and we can have grace. And yes. so, you know, it's just all wiped clean, which, again, there's no development or learning of the soul. And so my understanding of the term karma is that it means to be at cause. And so if you, for me, my understanding is, you know, a object set in motion remains in motion yes. unless it's acted upon by totally. something that redirects it. So if you have a pattern of thinking, say anger and hatred, in one life it may manifest as uh, murder and another life it may manifest in some other form, mm -hmm. but you're going to keep recreating and attracting those events to you until that, as you say, frequency gets changed inside of you. So you can do that uh, by doing inner work, yeah. by doing, you know, on whatever kind of forms, spiritual work, where there's real change and development that's happening on the inside, not just behaviors, but those patterns of thought and thinking, uh, thought and thinking, thought and thinking, oh my God, <laughs> thought, and, thought and feeling, feeling and behaviors and actions and things like that. Yep. Yep. And, and if, if it's true, I mean, because we're talking about theories, right? Right. I mean, at least for me, I don't know. I haven't been there. I mean, I'm, I might be totally shocked and surprised. Mm -hmm. um, but theoretically, you're setting yourself up for your next life as well. Yeah. So you want to make as much progress as you can, right? Yeah. So there's motivation. Yeah, that's, that's another great point, too, is that um, <clears throat> uh, Roth, I found this really interesting. Ra talks about how at some point in your evolution, uh, at the beginning stages of first density, second density, and even in the beginning stages of third density, he says that reincarnation is just sort of immediate because mm -hmm. you, there's nothing to really learn because you're not very self-aware yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so like this is a, you know, you as the soul who incarnates have already made this agreement of like, just keep putting me down there until so I go through the evolutionary process. Because from the perspective of eternity, you know, like an 80 year lifetime feels like a long time, but it's from that perspective, it's like walking into a movie and walking out of a movie. Right. It just eclipses like this. Right. So, so you don't mind incarnating for one specific theme to learn one lesson, right? 
which we see a lot of people that have, have chosen certain lessons where, you know, they might die at a young age from something. And they chose that lifetime because they were trying to learn one specific thing and they didn't care to stick around after that. They've been here, you know, a hundred times already. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of nice to, um, to stop judging people for the lifetimes that they're living, but understanding that these people chose these lifetimes because they need to learn these specific lessons for their journey. Right. And some people choose a more difficult journey because it speeds up their evolution a lot. And so like he talks about this a couple of different places, but third density is the most difficult density level. Um, I think he says at one point, it's like a hundred times more difficult than, wow. than anything else because of the level of catalyst that's available here, um, mm -hmm. which is also why our lifetimes are very short, you know, 80 years or so. Um, he said a fourth density, you know, lifetime is like 90,000 years. Wow. Um, so if that's true, that would mean that the reason our lifetime is so short is in comparison to the amount of suffering we experience here. So in a sense, you could say this is as bad as it ever gets, you mm -hmm. know, and it's as bad as you make it, obviously, but right. the perspective of the amount of uh, catalyst available, suffering available, this is as bad as it ever gets. And from here on out, there's just amazing lessons to be learned and evolution to be had. So a lot of souls are eager to get that process going. So mm -hmm. he talks about why people will choose really, really tough lifetimes, because it's sort of like um, people who skip grades in school or whatever. They, they choose an AP class or whatever because right. they want to get on with college, right? They don't right. their senior year of high school. Same concept. And so I think that the idea of reincarnation makes a lot of sense when you look at it from the perspective of uh, school, right? Right, right. This universe is a university. We're all here to learn and evolve and grow. And so like, you know, you start at kindergarten and you work your way up and you can't um, go from kindergarten to eighth grade. Right. You don't have access to eighth grade yet. Right. You don't have any of the understandings of second through seventh grade. And so um, why, why would it make sense that God would be like, okay, I expect these kindergartners to pass their physics tests by the end of the year, right. or I'm going to punish them forever. Right. Right. Like they have no <laughs> shot. Right. And likewise, we have, no shot at understanding and learning and mastering the human experience in one lifetime. Yeah. Well, and just think about it on a practical level too, Aaron, think about how seriously, if you think this is your one life, think about how seriously sometimes we take our decisions or our mistakes, or we're afraid to take risks because mm -hmm. especially as you get older, as you get, you know, more middle age and you're, you feel that biological clock, you know, running out. Uh, you're less likely to take risks and do things uh, than maybe someone younger like yourself because you begin to think, wow, I don't have as much time to recover. Yeah. Maybe only got 10 more good years or whatever. But if you think about it in terms of if this, if this is all real and true, and this is just one aspect of many aspects of my soul or many lifetimes, then this one mistake is really meaningless um, in the, in the overall expanse of it. And it kind of frees you up to, uh, <clears throat> to be able to make mistakes and you yes. grow from your mistakes. You just do. That's a great point, man. Yeah. Don't be afraid to try something. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Right. Um, really just don't take your life so damn seriously. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only for suffering sure. comes from that. That's for absolutely <clears throat> sure. And I'm sure that it's true for you as it is for me and so many people listening when I was really steeped in the Christian model of reality, man, I'm telling you what, the amount of stress that, that puts you oh, in yeah. to believe that, like, this is my one shot to fulfill my destiny. Yep. Better not get it wrong. Yep. I'll find the wrong life partner, have the wrong career, whatever. That's a exactly. terrifying thing to, to believe, you know? Yeah, exactly. It is. And really quick before we segue into the biblical stuff, Sure. One more uh, super obvious uh, uh, misconception to reincarnation that I also hear a lot of is like the idea that, oh, like I might come back as a bird in the next life. <laughs> you know, like that's reincarnation is so stupid. I would never do that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, I understand that if you don't really know what reincarnation is, you might think stuff like that. But uh, just understanding that it is an evolutionary journey of the creator knowing itself, learning the lessons of what it is like 
sort of like the idea of a clam with a, uh, a grain of sand. Mm -hmm. That grain of sand is the catalyst, right? The suffering, the friction, the contrast that causes the clam to create a pearl. Mm -hmm. So you think of the pearl as God's essential nature, you know, love, wisdom, grace, truth, beauty. Uh, and those things can only be known conceptually, experientially known through the contrast of the opposition to the polarity of those things. And that's what we're doing here, plain and simple. So mm -hmm. take the pressure off yourself. Just strive to know yourself above everything else. Know who you are. And if you know yourself, you will know who God is. Mm -hmm. It's good. So <clears throat> in segueing to that, um, what most people are probably really interested in listening, uh, the, the Christian audience I have anyway, is, right. is there any biblical evidence for reincarnation or does this show up? Did the, you know, did the Jewish people believe in this? Right. What kind of, what kind of insights can you offer us on that? Yeah. So I think I'd, I'd like to, again, frame out the question, can a Christian believe in reincarnation? And you know, it's an interesting question because what makes someone a Christian? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it was a term, you know, early on in that, like, like one of the things that I thought, Aaron, when I first started studying, because I wanted the truth. I mean, that's one thing that we really have in common. We, yeah. we have a heart that says, I don't want to believe something that's a lie just because everybody else in my world believes it or, totally. or whatever. And so we question a lot. Right. And so I thought, you know, if I could go back and understand early Christianity, first century Christianity, what mm -hmm. was the early church like? Cause we have this idea that it was pure and it was pristine and there was one teaching uh -huh. and there was one group and there was one stream. <laughs> and when you study it out, you find out nothing could be further from the oh truth. Oh my gosh. And that as Christianity evolved through the centuries, of course it became part of the, the state. It became a political uh, tool yeah. uh, to sort of, you know, in an oversimplified way to sort of reconstitute and rebuild the Roman empire. Uh, but also it became more, it became more symmetrical. It became more unified. So the truth is Christianity is more unified today in terms of their beliefs than they were early on because you had Gnostics, you had various different groups. I see. You, yeah. Yeah. And so you had all kinds of, uh, so this idea that we could go back to the origin or origin, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the closer we get to the, the master Jesus, the, the more pure the teaching is going to be is really a fallacy. And, mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that frustrates me is, is um, you know, Carl Jung said, certainty is the sign of an uncultivated mind. Yeah. And that is absolutely the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that frustrates me in dealing with people who are stuck in dogma is it just isn't that damn simple to figure all this <laughs> stuff out. It just isn't. Yeah, it's just not. And they take it for granted that their way is right and what they heard is right and their translation to right and whatever. And the more you dig in, the more you cultivate, the more you realize you know, I really don't know yeah. um, a lot of this stuff. So really, so if you're going to ask the question from, from a 21st century perspective and over the last several centuries, you're not going to, reincarnation is not a Christian teaching, right? It, it absolutely is not. You're not going to find it, you know, in the Protestant Reformation, you're not going to find it in the Catholic, the Greek Orthodox, any of the different streams of Christianity. But if you take a broader perspective and you look at some of the early church fathers, and this is what cracks me up, because you, you got guys that will wear you out, right? Because you're contradicting, you yeah. know, this council, and they like to throw out big words that nobody knows what the hell they mean. Mm -hmm. Like um, you're being Arian or you're being uh, Gnostic or you're being whatever. Mm -hmm. And and they go back to these, you know, great uh fathers of the church who gave us the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the incarnation, but sporadically throughout their writings, they also talk about reincarnation. Mm. Now they don't use that term. Um, one of the terms that's used is transmigration of the soul. Wow. And so if a person doesn't know that and they're reading the church fathers and they come across transmigration, they're not necessarily going to understand what that is. <clears throat> But um, Gregory of Nyssa, who's one of the fathers who's venerated for hammering out the doctrine of the Trinity, has some quotes in some of his writings where he talks about, now, now again, the doctrine of hell is a Latin interpretation of scripture that's based on mistranslations. And so um, 
and, and Gregory of Nyssa says, you know, people who make mistakes in this life, if they don't grow and develop and get it right, some of the things that we're saying, mm -hmm. they will have opportunities to do that in their next lives. Yeah. Justin Martyr, who's a name that's familiar to maybe yes. Catholics or whatever, he was someone else who, in his writings, <clears throat> affirmed belief in uh, reincarnation. And then, of course, the most well-known is um, the Church Father Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he's esteemed as the most uh, educated uh, of all of the early church fathers. But in the sixth century, he was condemned as a heretic, primarily on his belief on the, in the pre-existence of the soul. Ah. Now, th th there's a lot in the Bible about the fact that you didn't just, you know, come into existence in oh, your yeah. mother's womb. Yeah. You know, Jeremiah chapter one is a classic uh, text for that. God yeah. shows up to Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Yeah. He, he didn't say, I thought about you. I, yeah. I have planned a life for you. I have a purpose for you. He said, I knew you. And so that implies that that separation and that knowledge that we're talking about. You who? Yeah. And I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. So uh, what were we doing? It, let's, let's just say that the, the prevalent Western belief that this is one life and one shot is, is all there is, um, is true. But if we are eternal souls, what were we doing? Were, yeah. were we just waiting up there in bliss on our opportune moment? And then do we sacrifice bliss because we didn't get the information right about what Jesus did for us <clears> on the cross? Yeah, why the hell would we come down here if we were up there before? Yeah, exactly. And then what, about, what do you do with people who go to hell? I mean, so they were existing in heaven for eternity past with God, and then all of a sudden now they're here. And now, I mean, who would come? <laughs> like, are yeah. you kidding me? I'm not no risking way. that. So then where's free will? God's saying, see, so when you start thinking these things through and you start asking questions, there are a lot of just uh, logical fallacies yeah. that we do that you can see that these things aren't, aren't very well thought, thought through. Yeah. So let's take the cardinal doctrine of the Trinity, because there's nowhere in the Bible that I can find that teaches reincarnation. Mm -hmm. But... Orthodox Christianity is based on the belief in the Trinity, the way that the councils hammered it out. Yeah. But you won't find the teaching of the Trinity in the scriptures. Right. And so they'll say, well, it's not taught directly in scripture, but it's alluded to. But if you start talking about reincarnation, they're going to condemn you and I as heretics right off the bat. Oh, yeah. So we will apply this set of logic and say, oh, no, brother, you absolutely have to believe in the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Well, but there's no scripture that teaches the Trinity. Well, this is true. It's not directly mentioned, but it's alluded to <laughs> in the Bible. So then you say, OK, well, well wait a minute. Now, reincarnation is it taught in scripture, but it's alluded to. Right. And they'll say, well, you can't form a doctrine out of an uh, out of something that's just alluded yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. So they so they change their criteria based upon their own prejudice and self-serving bias. Yeah. And they can't and, and can't see that that's what they're doing. Some of the same fathers that gave you the Trinity believed in reincarnation. So what do you do with that? Oh, interesting. Go I would e I would even say that the majority of what mainstream Christianity believes today isn't in the Bible. That's true. The Antichrist, right? The rapture, rapture, original right. sin, yep. Trinity, like none of these doctrines are actually taught in the Bible anywhere, right? They're all just sort of inferred from a conglomeration of verses, right? The way so, goes. so just a few verses, and there's there's a bunch. I mean, we could get into a bunch, but um, and maybe I'll do an episode on it on my YouTube, uh, YouTube channel should. that I'm just getting started, but. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, here's just a couple that are maybe some well-known ones, Job says, you know, after all the tragedy strikes Job, and Job is, mm -hmm. the book of Job is considered to be one of the oldest books in the Bible, right? Yeah. And Job says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. Mm. Now, we have to superimpose on the text. The way we process that in our brains is you came out of the womb naked, and you're not going to take anything with you when you die. Right. But, but Job did not say, naked I was born and naked I shall die. That's right. not what he said. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. Yeah. He's not going to return to his actual physical mom's womb. Well, but I, th but I think what he's talking about, the cycle of rebirth there, that I right. came from oh, yeah, one yeah. womb naked and I returned to another womb. Oh, okay. You I was thinking like the womb of creation or something. 
Yeah, maybe. Or yeah. maybe it's just Either that way. simple. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but the, here's the one that's, that's hard. I think that's the most pointed. Okay, so here, here's a couple. Jesus says to his disciples in one place, Matthew 16 is a reference for it. He says, uh, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Yeah. And yep. they respond, some say you're Elijah. Mm-hmm. Some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Yep. Now, how could they say that? If they didn't believe in reincarnation. Yeah. Because Jeremiah died. You know, I mean, you can make the case Elijah didn't die. He 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 was he was transferred, you know, in a chariot or whatever. Right, but Jeremiah right. died. One of the prophets died. And Jesus doesn't correct that. He no. just says, Who do you say that I am? Right. Because the truth is that reincarnation is a prevailing doctrine within Judaism. Wow. And you could go back to quotes from, again, you've got this Jewish roots movement. People, you know, well, if the Jews believe it, then it's, it's got to be, you know, what the Christians believe. And then they'll go and quote uh, rabbis from the 17th century, from the 12th century, and things like that. But these same rabbis from the 12th and 17th centuries, one of them says that, uh, you know, the doctrine of reincarnation is what Judaism teaches, and that all the sages and wise rabbis down through the ages are in 100% agreement with that. Mm. Uh, Plato taught reincarnation. So in the first century world that Jesus is in, the Greco-Roman world is steeped both with Judaism and with the Greco-Roman culture in reincarnation, and yet you don't see a direct rebuttal of it coming from Jesus or even from the apostles. Anywhere, really. Right. So here's here's the classic example. And this is the one that really stumped me when I was reading scripture. I mean, I wrestled with this for years, literally for years. (laughs) In John chapter 9, Jesus meets a man who's born blind. Yes, I love this passage. And his disciples say to him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Right. And Jesus doesn't answer the question. Jesus says, you know, neither this man nor his parents sinned, Mm -hmm. uh, but for the glory of God, you know, this man came into being, which I think we automatically run to, well, the miracle. But I think, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's a powerful truth in there for people with disabilities Mm -hmm. that Jesus is looking at the man born blind and says, the purpose of his existence is not about what happened in the past, either by him or by his parents, but rather as a human being, he is displaying the glory of God. And Mm -hmm. you need to begin to show dignity and honor towards the human being, regardless of what your prejudicial and inherited judgments are. Beautiful. So I think that's the first thing. But taking it back to the issue of reincarnation, if the man is born blind, how did he sin before he was born? Yep. You have to ask yourself that question. And Jesus does not use that as an opportunity to say, well, pff, of course, you idiot. <laughs> he couldn't have sinned before he was born because this is your one shot. And if you don't get it right, you're going to burn for all eternity. And karma doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> right. So they're basing that question. And, and actually, if you study it out, there was disagreement among the Jews. There's a verse in uh, the Torah that says the sins of the fathers will follow the children to the fourth and fifth generation. Mm -hmm. And so there was a debate. Did that passage mean your parents as other than you, or was it speaking about past lives? Mm -hmm. So in other words, was God saying that the sins that you commit in this life, you will uh, be visited with in four or five lifetimes? Right, that precede you, the same soul, or separate souls being punished for the sins of their parents. Yeah. So that's a current debate at the time of Christ. Like, why should I pay for my great grandparents' sin? Yeah, and there's justice, right? Shouldn't I have a clean slate, a clean opportunity? Right. So the disciples are asking that they're inviting Jesus into this um, into this debate. Who sinned? Which group's right? Who sinned? This man, meaning that that scripture reference is to future lives of the same soul, or his parents, meaning this soul is suffering for the sins of another soul. Uh, So they're trying to get Jesus to settle the question. 
Yeah, which they often do. Yeah, which of course he never does. <laughs> <laughs> but see there again, Aaron, we think certainty and having the answers and all this stuff is what Christianity is about. It's what the Bible's about. You just go to the Bible. I, mean, I remember as a young believer, it took so much pressure off me because I didn't have to think for myself. Right. I didn't, I, I didn't have to, I had a map for life. I had a guidebook for life. And, and I would tell people, that's not my opinion. That's the word of God. <laughs> no. And you just yeah, surrender I, your judgment to really your interpretation or the interpretation of the culture around you and what they've instilled within you. Mm -hmm. And yet you don't find Jesus giving these answers of certainty about these questions that the disciples themselves are struggling with. Yeah. Now, the third reference that I would use in Scripture comes from the book of James. And in the book of James, it says uh, the tongue uh, is set among the members and that it sets uh, that it, the tongue itself is a fire mm -hmm. and that it can set on fire. The course of nature is how a lot of Bible translations translate it, the course of nature. Hmm. Well, if you look up the original Greek word there, the Greek word there actually is the wheel of life. Uh. Or, and so in one context, it could mean uh, your descendants, the generations after you. But really, when you take into consideration the, the prevalent belief in reincarnation from that time period, it makes perfect sense because the other meaning of that word is the cycle of death and rebirth. Right. So James is saying your tongue can set on fire the cycle of death and rebirth, and your tongue is set on fire by hell. Part of the reason that re now, so here's another interesting thing from these same church fathers. A lot of them say that there was an esoteric teaching or an oral teaching or a hidden teaching hmm. that Jesus gave to his disciples and that was not meant to be part of the public teaching. See, people don't understand, when they said Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would be part of the canon of Scripture, they were saying this is okay for public teaching. Right. But there was an oral or an esoteric teaching that was recognized that Jesus gave to his disciples, that his disciples then passed on, that the Gnostics said that yes. they were the heirs of that tradition. And several of the church fathers, or a few of them, maybe not several, I misspoke, but at least a few of them, reference this sort of hidden esoteric teaching of Jesus, and they say that he talked about reincarnation and these kinds of things. Mm. And that, that's all within the context of our Christian heritage. Mm. Do you know if uh, the Gnostic Gospels ever refer to reincarnation at all? Yeah, there are references like in um, some of the, I think, the secret Gospel of John. Uh, you can find all kinds of references on the yeah, internet. Yeah. Just Google, you know, early Christian Gnostics and reincarnation or early church fathers quoting, you know, uh, quotes of reincarnation, things of like that. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that in the sixth century, uh, Emperor Justinian calls a uh, council and they condemn all of Oregon's teachings mm -hmm. as being heretical, specifically the pre-existence of the soul yeah. being one of those. And so at that point, then, uh, it, it became illegal, I guess you could say, <laughs> for a Christian to believe in reincarnation and still call themselves a Christian or a follower of Jesus. Yeah. But for the first six centuries, you know, that wasn't the case. Now, I'm not yeah. saying it was prevalent. I'm not saying it was the main teaching. But you could be a Christian and believe in reincarnation for 600 years. Right. Now, America is 200, not quite 250 years old. So we'd have to go through that again yeah. and then add another century wow. for people to appreciate how long it took for reincarnation or references to the preexistence of the soul and that kind of thing to be removed uh, as even a possibility mm -hmm. for a Christian, even a question for them to ask. Yeah. or a possibility for them to explore, or a theory for them to entertain. That's a great point, because I think uh, a lot of the reason Christians will just totally poo-poo on reincarnation is because, you know, they have the totally misguided belief that, well, Jesus talked about hell, so obviously he didn't believe in reincarnation. And uh, right. as you and I know, and we've both made videos about, not only does Jesus not mention hell, oh, it's nowhere in the Bible, at least in terms of how Christianity frames it, it's nowhere right. to be found. I mean, it's not there. 
Right. And this the little verses that uh, that people say is alluding to it is like, oh, they'll be cast out when there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, and to extrapolate that into like eternal torture is just crazy to me. But that yeah. could be a whole host of things, right? Right. Um, one of them being you will experience your own wickedness. You will maybe have you'll come back in another lifetime where you'll try to learn that lesson from the other end of the spectrum. Um, you know, there's all kinds of way more practical. Well, and, and in the modern streams of, of like the more mainstream sort of charismatic movement and stuff that, that I've come out of the vineyard movement, yeah. Bethel, um, yeah. uh, they talk about the kingdom and the, the idea yeah. that the kingdom is, is a present reality. It's the, the present tense of the kingdom, the now and the not yet. Mm -hmm. And so those verses about weeping and gnashing of teeth are about those who are outside of the, the kingdom. And so they pick and choose. So in, totally. in this instance, well, in this instance, when it comes to healing, when it comes to gifts of spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom is now, the kingdom is present. But in these other verses where it's talking about weeping and gnashing of teeth, oh, no, 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 that's the kingdom of heaven and the future afterlife. And the Bible and Jesus does not make those distinctions. Yeah. And so when you strip away and this is what happened to me. And this is what I think is happening to a lot of believers. When you strip away your preconceived notions and your presuppositions mm -hmm. and you read the text, yeah. then you realize that it is not simple <laughs> and it is not cut and dry and it is not black and white and that you can see why people have wrestled with these and why people who didn't grow up learning these things and being programmed in their subconscious with these yeah. things through Sunday school or Christian education or whatever when they were children, why they go to the Bible and say, I read the Bible and it doesn't make any sense. And we come along and say, oh, well, they're not regenerate. They're not born again. Well, then how the hell do they ever get saved? Right. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so it's just another one of those logical things. It's like we have these pat answers for everything because the bottom line is we have a need for certainty. The bottom line is, I mean, I'm afraid of death. I haven't conquered my fear of death. I don't know exactly what's out there. We're mm -hmm. discussing, at least in my view, theories from, from you know, things that have scientific uh, uh, verification. Uh -huh. Like the book that you mentioned and the psychiatrist and there's uh, the website that you mentioned. Yep. So science does seem to point to those things, but we haven't experienced that yet. And so right. am I afraid of, do I want to die? Am I afraid of death? Yeah, actually I am. Was I afraid of death when I believed I was going to just go on to glory? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could tell myself and put yeah. on the face. Yeah, I'm not, but my car almost veer off the road or something. I mean, my heart's pounding and my, I'm like, Oh, okay. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. so we have a need to comfort ourselves psychologically because we have such a need for certainty on these things. And so what happens is, is when people have just these pat answers and they're just, this is what you have to believe. And this is the way it is. And this is the word of God. And I suggest you meditate on it because if you don't, you're going to be lost forever. Yeah. And, you know, all this stuff is really their own psychological need for certainty and to make sense of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I get it. I understand it. And in some cases, it's not even uh, spiritually beneficial to the person. It's not psychologically healthy to strip away that need for certainty. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you have, if you're watching this and you have that, then please, by all means, that's part of your journey. Yeah. And if, if the things we're talking about is a accurate reflection of reality, then you chose that, you need that, and God bless you. 100%. And even the video that you just made, Jesus in the Shadow Self, mm -hmm. and uh, the video I just made, God Has No Concept of Forgiveness, we both talked about this idea of the shadow self mm -hmm. and the parts of us that we've disowned and suppressed and exiled from our consciousness creates this huge fragment, this huge dark side that then rears its ugly head all the time. And I right. think that maybe one of the biggest fragments of all is that fear of death. Uh, fear of our own, our own mortality. And uh, again, we're here to learn lessons about what God actually is in God's own self, which God is eternal. So how do you learn that you're eternal? You're confronted with the fear of death. And so when you suppress that fear and try to hide it, stuff it in the closet, and cover its mouth, duct tape, and no, I have certainty, I have all the answers. My ego feels really good about that. Right. You're just actually energizing that dark part of you to screw with you more when no one is watching you and when you're home alone at night 
and you're thinking about, am I really, what is going to happen when I die? And that fear is going to continue to haunt you. And I think that that model of reality where you get this one shot, you better figure it out. If not, you're screwed. That model perpetuates that um, suppression of our fear of death because it, it doesn't allow Christians the territory to even ask the question of what happens after I die. Where do we really go? What really is the afterlife? Because they're selling you certainty. And they're saying, right. oh, no, don't even think about it. I have the answer for you right here. You're good. Right. And that's not right. Happening. Yeah, and, and it's also something that can't be challenged because nobody's going to come back and tell you you were wrong. Right. So I can have evangelistic meetings and campaigns and... Say whatever you want. Yeah, and tell them about life after death and all that. And that's one of the things that bothered me as a pastor when I started asking these questions. What if it's wrong? Because, see, here's the, here's the problem that I see, Aaron. Where do we find a pathway within both of our experiences? And I'm not trying to just pick on this one group. So let's make it more generalized. Yeah. But where do we find a pathway with that kind of easy believism and certainty? Where is the pathway to do real shadow work, to do real internal integration, yeah. or to mature and grow and polish your soul and learn the lessons of love? If we tell somebody, hey, you pray this prayer and you're yeah. good, you're in. Yeah. Um, and what if that's not true? Yeah. And so what if they waste their development in this life? It isn't true. And then get die. And then, whoa, they're like, dang, Pastor Aaron lied to me. Or, you know, I don't, I don't like to be called Pastor Aaron anyway, but, okay. you know, the pastor lied to me or the preacher lied to me or, right. or, or whatever. And so that began to concern me. And so then I thought about it from a different perspective. And I thought, okay, if a person does the work and they grow and they mature and they learn lessons and they learn how to love mm -hmm. and they leave this life. And let's say that the Christian church has it right. Let's say that you have one shot at it. You stand before your creator and you're going to be judged. You mean to tell me that our creator is not going to honor the work that was done there. <laughs> Right, like, and it's going to say, well, I'm sorry, you got sprinkled instead of dunked, <laughs> or you got baptized as a Baptist instead of a Catholic, or uh -huh. you just didn't pray the prayer right. Yeah. Uh, or you believed it at a certain time in your life, but you didn't believe it later in your life. So too bad, so sad that you actually prayed to get saved from that car accident, because if you'd have died back then, you'd been good. Yep. Bye-bye. Say hello to Hitler. Yeah, exactly. And so... I just began to look at that and say, if, how can we as a spiritual community give people models for growth and development and change and transformation that actually work for them and address the real issues in their life and then leave the afterlife stuff to itself? Yes. When I was a Christian kid growing up, I could not figure out why. I, I wanted to do what was right more than anything else. Like I was so devout in my sincerity and my faith but I couldn't stop lusting and, and swearing and stuff like that. And I would just go, I don't get it. The Bible says I confess Jesus. I'm a new creation. There's no sin left in me, but yet I keep sinning. Uh, <laughs> what's the deal here? Right. 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 <laughs> and you're absolutely right, Aaron. Like that, that belief that, Oh, you pray a prayer. You're good. That prevents people from really looking and facing their own inner demons and, their conditioning and the things that the traumas they've experienced, the programs that are in there, as you and I know, and everyone listening knows, I don't, I could care less if someone believes in God or confesses Jesus. That means absolutely nothing. Those statements are utterly meaningless. I know people who say they believe in God or have confessed Jesus who are the most evil, selfish, horrible people you've ever met. And right. I know people that are amazing and wonderful. Right. So obviously, being uh, a reflection of Christ has literally nothing to do with believing he died for your sins. Right. So then what was the transformation he was talking about? What was the rivers of living water he promised us? It must be that we find something within ourselves that resonates with what we see in Christ. Absolutely. And, and if, if we find that, if we discover that, because for me, that's the pearl of great price. That's the yep. treasure hidden in the field. Kingdom of heaven. It, and that is the kingdom of heaven that's at hand. And so if we discover those things, then um, to me, I, I totally agree with you. That's sort of the main thing. You know, if, if I could kind of like 
deviate into this this idea while we're talking about growth and transformation. Mm-hmm. You'd asked me before we started the the broadcast of our show, whatever we call it these days. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to call it. Honestly. <laughs> uh, before we started the video about because I'm a professional counselor, uh, if I you know run across people doing past life therapy or, or things mm-hmm. like that, and uh, and I always kind of joked around. I knew people that were doing past life therapy that weren't professional counselors that were making a heck of a lot more money than I was. Making. <laughs> and, and my problem, my issue with that is we can, we can kind of make that stuff up. Now totally. if it works for a person and it helps a person. Great. But it's, it's much harder to validate, but people would ask me, you know, what about past life therapy? And I think, well, you know, I've had more crap to deal with in this life. Like <laughs> I've had plenty of traumas that I'm still trying to recover from. There's a reason like, we don't like, remember those. Like facts. why in the heck would I want to <laughs> go back and dig up trauma from, you know, five lives ago or whatever. Yeah. But, but I do believe if in, in this model that the, it's sort of fractal, right? So yeah. there's, there's patterns that whatever we brought from us from those past lives, we can work through with whatever we're facing in this life. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it can be a bit of a distraction for people mm-hmm. uh, if they start thinking, oh my gosh, I've had past lives and they want to go back and find out what their past lives are. Right. And I've met people like nobody's ever like the janitor in the past life. Like nobody's ever yeah, yeah. like, you know, like I was, uh, I was, uh, she was <laughs> like every lifetime she had like stopped. <laughs> but it, that's kind of in both. Yeah, for right, right. And so, but it's kind of in vogue, you know, like in the past life, I was, a, I was, you know, always somebody, you know, wonderful and dynamic. Celebrity of some sort, yeah. Yeah, Madonna at one point said she was Evita in, in a past life or whatever, when she was, you know, making the movie with Antonio Banderas or whatever. Kudos, Madonna. Yeah, right. But I also think it can be a distraction for people to go back and think, well, okay, so to get better at in this life or to You're overcome this issue your past lives i've got to go back to my past life and resolve it and then yeah. pretty soon you're, you're not doing the real work so i'm a firm believer that whatever patterns are showing up in our life whatever problems we're working through whatever challenges we're facing are exactly what we need right now yes and that we have everything that we need to work through what we're supposed to work through in this incarnation Preach. and then when we leave you know we'll we'll move on to whatever the next lesson is whatever form that takes whatever density, whatever level of density that you're talking about that we, we enter into. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Like, you don't need to know your past lives to know what lessons you're here to learn. Like, you are, you are experiencing whatever you are a vibrational match to. So if you need to learn lessons of humility, the universe will continue to offer you opportunities <laughs> to help you, right? Dang, Aaron, you just asked a question I've been asking myself for <laughs> 20 years. I 20 years of ministry, 20 years of ministry. God, why did you do this to me? Why are you humbling me constantly? <laughs> well, that's exactly it, is that your, your life's circumstances, uh, your suffering is that catalyst for your evolution because the only way to get out of that pattern is to transcend it. Right. So the only way to stop being humiliated is to become humble. Right. And I think the other thing I would tell people then is the only place we can do the work then is here. Yes. That's why we come here. Right. (laughs) So it's the exact opposite of what we think. We think, well, when I get to heaven, you know, everything will just be like, I don't know. Somehow we just step out of this body. We're out of this sinful world. We're out of this sinful body. And so now we're just perfected and able to be with this perfect God who can't look on sin. Yeah. And I think it's, It's the opposite. I think that we can only do the work in this body and in this dimensional reality that we're supposed to do. And if we don't do the work in this life, then guess what? If it's true, we get to come back out and do it all over again. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder about some of my friends who are really stuck in their fundamentalist thinking and won't engage these issues and won't think about it. And yet they're consistently confronted by it and getting upset about it. And I just think, how many times have you been born in a fundamentalist family and had no fun in your life. (laughs) None whatsoever. (laughs) And had opportunities to break out of that pattern and that vibrational frequency. And you didn't get it right. And you keep coming back and doing it over and over and over again. So it's not like you can sidestep the issue because I can hear some people thinking, well, brother, if you're right, uh, then I'll just come back in this life. 
But if I'm right, you know, then you're going to burn for eternity or whatever. And so mm -hmm. the safest bet is to just stick with where I am. Pascal's that's wager. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's that's the um, the trick of the of the psyche or of the ego. But the truth is, what if it's what if part of the work that you're supposed to do, what part of the work that I'm supposed to do in this life is asking these questions and growing and developing in my concept of God. And what if I didn't make those choices because it's just easier and safer to stay in the world that I was a part of before? Well, yeah. then I get to come back and do it again. Yeah. The whole Pascal's wager thing is just an absolute waste of time, a total contradiction. We could play this game ad infinitum, you know? I can mm -hmm. say, well, I have a Pascal's wager for you, brother. Suppose that believing Jesus died for your sins is actually the wrong thing to do. And the flying spaghetti monster will torture you with flaming spaghetti for all of eternity. Now I ask you, brother, what's safer to believe? We can do this forever. Yep. Let's stop being crazy and let's look at the actual observable facts of the universe, of the reality we're in, and start asking real questions. And when we do that, we find that, oh, there's actually no evidence whatsoever in the observable universe for that model of reality. Dang, brother, you hit the nail on the head right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, even because like you said a minute ago, if that model is true, then we then you have to accept the fact that God made some utter cosmic mistake that, you know, there's some loophole that he didn't foresee where sin came in the world. And he's like, oh, shit, now all my children are going to burn. So let me go unfix this loophole. I'll, I'll go down. I'll kill myself to forgive myself for what I did. It's, he needs a therapist. <laughs> which should tell us that that model has more to do with our own projections of our messed up psyche than the creator of the universe pretty safe to say i would think i think so <laughs> <laughs> and even if we talk about reincarnation what do christians say when what's the word christians use about the theology that god came down in human form they call it the incarnation Oh, okay. So we're okay with God incarnating once, but twice is right out. Mm -hmm. He would never do that, but he'd do it the first time. So even that doesn't make sense. Right. And like you were saying, the disciples were asking Jesus, oh, hey, did you used to be Elijah? Oh, right. bro, are you uh, J Jeremiah? A lot of Christians literally believe that Methuselah or whatever was Jesus. Hmm. I've heard, have you heard that idea? I've never heard that, Aaron. Is I thought it? I'd heard it all, but... Sorry, I, not Methuselah. <laughs> not Methuselah. Uh, what's the old, old, old Testament character that a lot of people say, oh, that was Jesus in a pre shadow form? Oh, Melchizedek. Thank you. <laughs> Methuselah. <laughs> I have a teaching about Melchizedek on my uh, YouTube uh, channel, by the oh, way. Oh, nice. I'll have to watch that later. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are you laughing with me or at me? Uh, probably a little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> Methuselah is the old dude, you know. The, Methuselah is like, the 900-year dude. <laughs> yeah. I actually thought it was a woman because it sounds like a woman's name. Could be. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a scandalous? Wouldn't that be scandalous? Jesus was a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and the heresies keep on flowing in right i know right yeah they say that god jesus used to be melchizedek i mean i've heard you know john oh, sure. and people like that preach that right stuff. so yeah, okay, i address that in, in the teaching yeah <laughs> yeah right reincarnation no he just kind of like i don't know man it's it, the more you get out of the box show. and then you look back at the box the more you think, how the heck did I ever get in that box in the first place? Yeah, the farther away you walk, the more you cringe when you look back. <laughs> That's for, it's the absolute truth. <laughs> absolutely the truth. And I have to, I, I just crack up at some of these guys that, you know, try to bring correction because it's like, dude, I mean, I wore the t-shirt. I mean, I printed the t-shirt. I didn't just wear it. I printed the t-shirt. I helped design the t-shirt. Branded it. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, whatever. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying I'm right and they're wrong. Um, because again, I, I just think it's important to wrestle with these questions. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that certainty doesn't allow you to wrestle with the question. Yeah. And none of us really know for 100% sure. We're just asking. Right. But it's a, a great lesson in humility to look back on where you came from and see just how wrong you were to the fact that it makes you embarrassed 
and go, okay, so there's probably things I believe now that are super wrong. Right. So let me just approach everything with an air of humility and grace and just say, I don't know for absolute certain, and I don't need to know for absolute certain. Exactly, because your survival then does not depend on your belief system. Yep. Your eternal survival. If, if God is the creator of all things, if God is the source of all life, then everything ultimately begins and ends in mystery. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's beautiful. Yeah, it is. Well, if you guys want to check out Aaron's channel, I'll be posting the link to that in the description box below. Um, once again, Aaron, thank you so much for joining me. I, there's nobody else I'd rather talk about taboo topics with than you. Um, <laughs> I appreciate you being here with me, man. Aaron, thanks. I really enjoyed it. And thanks for giving me the opportunity. My pleasure, sir. We'll do it again soon. Sounds great. I'll talk to you later, brother. All right, man. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.